Welcome to Check It Out with Jessica Lee. I have the CMO of Rambus here with me, Jerome Nadell. Welcome. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. So tell us what's been happening with Rambus. Exciting times for Rambus. You know, Rambus was founded in 1990. So um, here we are on the sort of 29th year. Um, Rambus is fundamentally a data company, a mm -hmm. semiconductor data company. Okay. Um, its foundations were really about moving data fast, um, where the data movement from random access memory to the processor, um, the interfaces between, and then moved on to other types of interfaces, not just memory to chip, but chip to chip. And that was sort of the first generation of the company. Um, it had a very large um, IP portfolio mm -hmm. and was monetizing that IP as the technology would be inserted as a micro ingredient into other products, chips, into devices, etc. cetera. Um, through time, and I only joined in 2012, there was a transition from IP as a revenue model to product. Mm -hmm. And a set of semiconductor products came out of that, but also another aspect of, of data, and that was safe. So the FAST is moving data efficiently um, and, and in a performant way. The SAFE is keeping that data safe. And that led into more product and more software. And in fact, as we'll speak about in a bit, um, through acquisition, you know, inorganic growth, um, a set of companies were acquired that were added to portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, some of them actually going straight into software, sort of virtual semiconductor of tokenization. Okay, and yes, that's the fintech. details. Um, of account numbers, credit cards, and the like, as this sort of data is stored and transmitted. Mm -hmm. So in short, Rambus is a company that moves data fast and keeps it safe. It has semiconductor foundations in core um, and has moved from IP to product, so exciting times. Uh, you're more than just a CMO. You've got this uh, GM responsibility for a fintech business unit, the tokenization. Yes. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, you know, I guess the theme is uh, be careful what you say because when you, you know, give advice, sometimes you get the responsibility. So we acquired a, a couple of companies that were wrapped into one transaction back in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a payments, a fintech play mm -hmm. and a uh, ticketing play. But the idea was about digitizing what historically were paper tickets yes. and storing the information of, of digital credit card details like in... Um, mobile payment, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung mm -hmm. Pay, um, in a secure way. And when we did this acquisition, you know, the, the software itself was very infrastructure level. And we felt that we could bring that closer to consumer. Mm -hmm. So beyond the ability to keep things safe, that could improve end user experience and the like. And um, as I was close from a marketing perspective and looking at product concepts, product portfolio, I was asked to take the leadership of the of the group, so I became a general manager a bit uh, about a year ago, mm -hmm. and uh, running this group. Yes. Okay, but does that really fit into the Rambus portfolio, or or how does that fit in? I guess. So actually, um, you know, Rambus from 1990 is on its fourth CEO. Um, the first CEO really supported the two brilliant Stanford folks that founded the company. The second one amplified the licensing, the IP licensing. The third that I came in with in 2012 really had a mantra of IP to product. And more recently, we've shifted to uh, a new CEO as the last one left. And we are going back to sort of semiconductor core mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So this division that focuses on software isn't really fitting into the play. Yes. And you know, as a marketing GM, I'm responsible for actually the strategic options of divesting the entity. So Jerome, uh, I'm fascinated uh, about this path that you're taking now, the company that you're trying to uh, divestify, mm -hmm. right? So um, what does it take? How, how does that work when you start to think about, okay, this unit is no longer considered semiconductor fitting, so therefore we need to do something about it. Yeah, you know, when you look at strategy, there's no perfect strategy. And mm -hmm. I, I think the, the thinking in acquisition was to create diversity in portfolio. Mm -hmm. And you know, clearly IP licensing is very high margin. So once you have these patents and you license them, you know, the, the operating income that you generate is very high. Semiconductor, you know, is expensive design starts and the margin that you make isn't necessarily as attractive as licensing or modern software, mm -hmm. like SaaS-delivered software. Mm -hmm. So the, the concept of acquiring was to extend the security play 
into a high margin SaaS delivered software service, mm -hmm. which makes great sense. But it is different than the rest of the company. So the focus in the current strategy is to go back to pure semiconductor. And that's why the board and the executive team, you know, after getting the gift of running the entity said, what could we do to find strategic options for it, um, you know, to be able to divest it. And I will say that firstly, I think that marketers, the way they think product first, you know, market centric, make good general managers. Mm. Um, but I think especially when you're being asked to divest an entity, the way you position and promote really leverages your marketing chops. And that's where we are now. We needed to sort of codify the view, the value, um, identify the right targets, almost like when you're selling any given product or offer segmentation and the like, and then um, you know ensure that we find the best home at the right price. So you're, you're looking at the company that potentially can buy this unit now? You're... You know, in classic form, two sides of it. So there could be those that would be sponsors as a private equity that would essentially acquire to look at some ultimate return mm -hmm. um, and provide operational support. And then those that are strategic where, you know, this entity that I'm running um, is well positioned in market. So from a consolidation play, a strategic would say, if we had their customer base, if we had their product portfolio, we would be more dominant in market. Um, so, you know, they're really bifurcated where the private equity has a view of this better generate return, you know, looking at EBITDA and these sorts of things. And then the um, strategics are a little bit more romantic saying, mm. you know, what would be what would we be like if we had this capability, this channel access, um, the team? And, I, you know, I'm probably biased, but I think we have a great team and I think it's, you know, incumbent on the senior manager to to articulate that, you know, with confidence and, and give that narrative, which is a lot of, you know, marketing and persuasion. Now, you study applied psychology. Um, way back when. Way back when. So uh, share with us your viewpoint then when it comes to like applied psychology and putting into actually the work uh, of being, doing marketing and now doing this uh, selling of this unit. You know, for my um, marketing colleagues, I, I, I don't want to be negative, but I, I was academically, it was applied experimental psychology. It mm -hmm. was pretty esoteric, mm -hmm. you know, looking at cognition and perception, how people think and process information, and what that meant in terms of the systems that we used. So even, you know, when I was working on a PhD, my, my esoteric research was looking at the way you display information to make it easier to process. Mm -hmm. And actually the Air Force was sponsoring some of this research, like in a heads up display at the yes. beginning of them. Do I um, separate things that I'm looking at so I'm looking around or do I put them all in the same location and update mm -hmm. them through time? Mm -hmm. And we were looking at sort of the, the cognition associated with how you would display that and what ultimately turned into usability and user experience. So out of graduate school, I definitely considered myself an applied experimental psychologist. And actually, you know, my first job was at the IBM Human Factors Lab, um, which was definitely more of a technical job. I then went over to um, Unisys, mm -hmm. and there I was acting in a research capacity, but quickly the marketing group said, the sort of research that you're doing actually supports the value proposition to our product. It was imaging technologies yes. back in the 80s, yes. um, which was new and the, the business case was predicated on improved human performance. Mm. So that was sort of my first crossing of the line, you know, over to the evil side of marketing. <laughs> the evil side. And, and I realized through time, as I sort of went back and forth between being the, you know, today what we speak of user experience, um, you know, uh, service design, and then back on the marketing side, that they're almost one in the same. And real quick, I, I think, you know, again, <laughs> being a bit older, I saw in the 80s, um, software was designed so people could be performant. You know, in the 90s, the beginning of internet and web and self-serve and making it desirable became something. And then in the new millennium, in the 2000s, experience became everything mm -hmm. and products and ser products became services and services were differentiated by how they delighted end users yeah. i would have never known this starting academically that you know really this aspect of designing things that are both performant and and beautiful would become the differentiator that makes you know the unicorns of today different than those that are not yes and i think marketers 
you know, often get trapped into promoting whatever they've been giving, given to help sales, as opposed to being connected to the concept of the product. So I'm a big believer in what I call design-led marketing, mm-hmm. which really says the marketer, the CMO, is responsible for the totality of the strategy into product, designing that product in the right way, or supporting, contributing to that, and then promoting you know, the goodness of what went into the product. Better products sell better. And it's not just, I have a great marketing campaign that's gonna get more sales. Sustainably, better products win. Yes, yes. Obviously. Um, now, you are very competitive uh, on the bike racing circuit, right? Want to share a little bit about that and how being competitive on the sports side is also good for, on the business side for you? Sure. Um, you know, firstly, yeah, I'm athletic. Um, I grew up running and I transitioned, um, you know, to triathlon and then I've been racing my bike for a long time. And um, they're competitive. You, you're I like, what did you say, American? I won the U.S. National Championship, mm-hmm. the Masters U.S. National Championship the year before last. Okay. Um, I won the best all-around rider in the, the bracket in California for the last three years. So I'm competitive, but I don't race in a competitive way against others. And let me explain what yes. I mean by that. Mm-hmm. I, I think that to win you know, is really about permissioning yourself to move forward. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of metaphor for business over here, too. And we spoke about that a little bit before that, you know, a a lot of times we just have a disbelief and that's the breaks that limit our ability to be successful, Mm -hmm. almost like lean startup leap of faith. You really need to cross that chasm to say, I see it on the other side. And nothing is more more pure than the the theater of racing Mm -hmm. when you're in two laps to go and you don't rationalize that it's not important. You make it important. And if you believe and you create that critical, this is important now, mm-hmm. amazing things happen and you move forward. And it creates a virtual cycle of success, no pun intended. Um, and yeah, I've had that luxury of, I, I know that there are guys out there that are stronger than me, that are fitter than me, But I think it's really a psychological game and it's psychological strength Mm -hmm. and belief. Mm -hmm. And I call it permissioning. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, as part of the executive team at Rambus and others I've participated in, I try to bring that metaphor to say, let's believe in ourselves. Let's permission ourselves forward. And I bring it back to marketing, you know, authentic marketing, Um, you know, the 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 notion of the the authenticity and the um, the goodness of what you do comes out if you believe that creates stronger brand if you believe in yourself it propels you forward yes. and uh yeah i i race a lot i do about 45 races a year wow. um it's it's a bit of a commitment but it it, uh, it definitely gives back wow it's been great conversation so what's exciting what's what's an initiative or exciting things that you're doing this next <laughs> well i'm pretty consumed right now you know my uh, uh my current mandate is to you know, help in these strategic options and at a human level, you know, there's north of 200 people that I'm responsible for. Mm-hmm. And um, I know there's inherent value back to positioning um, and permissioning in in what we're doing. So I just want to make sure that, you know, through authentic truth and, and proper positioning, we find the right acquirer with the right home. And we have a lot of interest in what we're doing. So, you know, that is my laser focus right now. Um, I do, I'm on a couple of advisory boards of startups, um, one nonprofit that I absolutely love. I love the notion of technology for good. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think you get to a point in your, in your professional career that it's not about taking, it's about giving. So I, I really try to sort of share views, um, wacky as they may be, <laughs> on how to think about marketing differently. Yes. You know, how to sort of lie on your back through empathy and imagine what sort of services you can create. Mm-hmm. Um, how to, you know, in the, these disruptive, discontinuity time yes. um, where the opportunities lie. So I'm really active in that too. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Jerome. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your philosophy also. So the audience I'm sure has uh, learned a lot. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, pleasure. And thanks for watching with us. Take it up with Jessica Lee.